Okay, I'm very excited to have on the show today John Knopfsinger, who is a professor of finance at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. He's a, a specialist in behavioral finance. In fact, he wrote a great book called The Psychology of Investing. In fact, I often think a lot of people in the world of investing are kind of psychotic, but maybe we'll get to that. John, tell me something. How can people become more rational when making investment decisions? Well, uh, thank you for having me on your show, Doug. And that's a good question, something that we're all trying to learn at this time. Behavioral finance is a relatively newer field compared to a lot of the things we know about finance. But one of the things we can do is the first thing is we can learn about the biases. In order to you know, not do them, we kind of need to know what they are, uh, how they work, what is leading us, what traps are leading us into causing us to make these bad decisions and having our emotions and biases affect those decisions. Once we kind of get a feel for that, I always like to practice. And the way I do that is I try to see those biases in others. You know, how are they behaving? What is causing their decisions? And, and see if we can identify them in others. And that, that helps us learn about them. And then I think a couple of important things is controlling your environment. If you, you know, if I'm on a diet, I don't keep donuts on the counter, right? I mean, you got to control your environment. And so you, mm -hmm. you do things to, to make decisions that are more deliberate, be slower. Uh, one of the things that I like to do if I buy a stock or, or have a, some sort of investment position, I like to determine when I'm going to, or how the conditions of selling, right? When I make the purchase, I don't wait until after my stock is losing money before I decide whether I should buy more or sell. I make those decisions ahead of time when I'm not emotional, when I'm not in the middle of this potential gain or loss. So those kinds of things are very helpful. And lastly, I would say have reminders. You know, there's a lot of tips we can tell ourselves. Uh, I remember one time I was at the Chicago Board of Trade and the, the futures traders on the floor. And one of them, he, he recognized his own behavioral bias while trading. And so he wore this shirt that had a big bear on one side and a big bull on the other to remind himself he can make money in bull markets and bear <laughs> markets. But along his sleeves, along his collars were pigs. And that was to remind himself not to take good positions because pigs always get slaughtered. That is great. That is great. So let's dive into this. So uh, you're, you're saying that in order for someone to not make the common mistakes that people make when they invest, and maybe we'll have a chance to emotional mistakes, maybe we'll, we'll dive into that. You said the first thing is just to learn about them, learn what the biases are. After you understand them, you got to practice. And a good way to practice is look at other people messing up. Then you said to control your environment, not to buy cookies and keep them on the table. And finally, you said, have a system, you know, decide when you're going to sell as soon as you invest. Don't just leave it up for, for uh, the fates to decide. And then I guess you said, and finally, is you have to have reminders to keep you doing this. But let's go back to the very first thing, which is if someone knows what he's doing, what he's doing or that he might be doing wrong, does that actually stop him from doing the mistake? Well, that, that, that's a great question. And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> a lot of these mistakes, you know, I, I, I can show, demonstrate things, you know, to, to a group of people and, and, you know, I can point out what we're doing wrong and then I can follow right up with another question and we can do it wrong again. So it is difficult. But that is very true. But also, there are plenty of opportunities to get ourselves out of the situation. When we, when we get into a situation, we've, we've lost money, we're very emotional about it, that does make it difficult to, even if we know the biases, it still is difficult to overcome them. That way, that's why we try to not get in that situation, make the decision before we get emotional. Mm -hmm. We're talking to Professor of Finance at the University of Alaska, John Knopfsinger, who, by the way, you may have seen in the Wall Street Journal or in Business Week, Smart Money, all over. He is constantly quoted for his expertise in behavioral finance. And one of the ways, John, maybe just correct me that, that I describe to people what behavioral finance really means is I say it's doing the wrong thing, even when you know what the right thing is to do. So it sounds to me a little bit like, uh, like what you're describing. Let's dive in a little bit. What is one of the most common psychological traps that you think people make that maybe by hearing us today, they will not do in the future? Yeah, well, I think 
There are a number of things. One of the things I like to tell people is remember the, the very first fundamental theory of finance, and that is risk and expected return go together positively. <laughs> if, you, if you want higher expected returns, you have to take more risk. You're not going to find a safe investment that makes you a lot of money. But for some reason... Boy, I wish people... We, hold on, let's just repeat that because I must say that every day in my practice, in real life, I'm not on the radio all the time, I'm a financial advisor. And people often say to me, oh, you know, I'll take one of those high risk, high return investments. And I say to them, what do you mean high risk, high return? It's high risk. If you make a high return, yippee. But it doesn't mean just because you took the risk, it doesn't mean you make the money. That's the whole point of risk. But I think that that doesn't always uh, sink in so well. Th that's right. Risk means it goes down just as much as it goes up. And our biases often lead us to, you know, suffer through the bad stuff and then then get out before <laughs> before the up stuff, the, the good stuff happened. So people who say, uh, sorry, I just want to dive into this one in particular, because a lot of times people will say, yeah, but I'm a long term investor. So so I understand the market may crash. You know, we've got this year has been quite a year, elections, we've got interest rates. Okay, fine, the market will go down. But as long as I'm a long term investor, why should I worry about that? Is that the answer? I think it is important to frame our, our short term decisions in our long term strategy. So I think it is helpful to, to be able to stay the course, so to speak, uh, when we have these uh, down drafts that we have in the markets periodically. So I, I do think having an ability to look at the bigger picture is very helpful. I like, by the way, that you use the phrase downdrafts. I'm thinking that on Wall Street, we've got phrases for everything to describe losing money without actually saying, holy cow, you just lost money. You know, there's a, a correction, you know, cyclical markets, right? We have all sorts of ways of saying what we don't want to say. Is that another psychological barrier that people have? <laughs> yeah, that's that's very well put. Um, when the market goes <laughs> down, we, we do have all of these uh, ways to uh, make it seem a little easier on us uh, to, you know, so we don't get quite as emotional about it. But when the markets mm -hmm. go up, it seems like we're, you know, we, we want all the euphoria. Right, right. All right, let's go back to, sorry, I, I, I distracted you from the question. I, I was you were beginning to tell us one of the psychological traps that, that messes people up. One of your favorites, what do you think? Kind of getting back to the risk return thing, the, people, the trap that people get into is they don't think of risk and return, they think of the word better. Better is a horrible word in finance. There is no investment that is better. There is investments that have the right characteristics for you or the wrong characteristics for you, but there's not one is better than the other. Because once you're in the better frame of mind, then you do start to think that things are safer and you earn more money because both of those are better things. Yeah, I think one, the way that I often will phrase it to people, again, I'm not complaining about the guys on Wall Street, but we have terms for everything. You know, we can talk to people about, well, you know, the, the beta on the portfolio is 1.2, but the managers are providing a lot of alpha and you know, and let's look at the standard deviation. At the end of the day, a you know, client's, you know, his eyes are rolling back in his head because even if he understands these terms, it's not speaking, it's not a language he speaks in. So I try to simplify, now maybe you're making me feel bad about the way I simplify it. I say, listen, there's only two ways you can improve your portfolio, which I guess is a way of saying to make it better. And that's either lowering the risk or increasing the return, or I guess some combination of the two. Is that what you mean by, is that a fair way, let's say, to say better, as opposed to better means just making a lot more money? Yeah, I, I think better in the context of individual securities is very dangerous. I think better can be used in a portfolio because we can reduce risk and still get higher returns in portfolios because now we're talking about reducing the firm-specific type risks. And so I, I think we're, we're a little bit okay there. But, but I find that the client's you know, you, you educate them on that whole diversification, the whole portfolio issue, and they, they totally get it. They, there's a lot of jargon involved, like you mentioned, and they totally get it. And, and then all of a sudden, they look at their portfolio and they point to the one or two things that went down and they said, let's sell that, you know, and they sort of forget the whole mm -hmm. idea of a portfolio <laughs> is of things that are going to move differently over time. And, and, and they understand it great ahead of time, but when they look at the result, they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And I also think that people have to realize that no one, and not even you know fancy advisors like me, can predict the future. 
I remember right after the UK voted to leave the European Union, one of my clients came in and said, well, Doug, you knew they were voting. You know, didn't you know the market was going to go down the next day? Why didn't you call us to sell? And I said, I had no idea the market was going to go down. And by the way, since then, the market has gone up a tremendous amount. So I think the, the, another, another factor is to realize that even if you don't feel you can measure risk, or the fact that you can't measure risk doesn't mean that someone else is able to eliminate it for you. It's, it, it's a fact of the market. So I really like that point that you're making. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, what's funny is I'll sometimes just tell people, listen, I, yes, we could predict the future, but we just charge a lot more for the service. Thanks again to John Nofsinger. He is a professor of finance at the University of Alaska. And make sure you check out his book, The Psychology of Investing. You've been listening to The Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. But if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.